why don't we uh, get started? So as I like to do, let's just re review where we um, have been recently, um, which is to um, discuss context-free languages. We talked about the context-free grammars and the push-down automata as a way of describing the context-free languages. Um, as you remember, uh, the context-free languages are a larger class of languages than the regular languages, which is where we started, the languages of the finite automata. So when you add a stack, you get more power, you get more languages uh, that you can do. Uh, um, and we're very rapidly going to be moving on today to um, our main model for the semester, which is called the Turing machine. Um, so let's just take a look at what we're um, uh, going to be covering today. And that is, um, uh, first we're going to show that uh, a technique analogous to the one we use for um, uh, proving that languages are not regular but this time for proving languages are not context-free. Um, so the push down automata and the grammars still have their limitations in terms of what we normally think a computer can do. Um, and with that, we're gonna use that as a kind of a lead into our general purpose model, which is the Turing machine. Um, and uh, so we're gonna talk about Turing machines and, of, and aspects uh, of, of that. Um, and I do, I would want to make comment. Uh, so I have posted the solutions for the first problem set. I know you're starting to think about the second problem set now, um, which I have posted as well. Uh, if you want to get a sense of what I'm looking for in terms of the level of detail, you can look at the solutions to problem set one, because I consider those to be model solutions. Uh, that's part of the reason why I post them, just to give you a sense of the level of detail that I'm looking for, which is not a whole lot but I do want to make sure you're capturing the main ideas um, of, what we, uh, of what's involved in solving the problem. So have a look at those. Um, and uh, for problem set two, which I'll talk about um, in a second, so I'll just say a few words if you wanna pull that up, um, you, know, you can do that. But just to get you started on a few of the problems, if you're uh, finding some challenges there, I, I don't want you to get stuck really before you even understand what the problem is saying. Um, so for problem number one, if you looked at that, so that's a problem where you're asked to prove um, a certain language is not context-free. So that's, um, and by the way, all of the problems in this problem set, except uh, perhaps for the last one, for number six, you'll be able to solve, we'll have enough material at the end of today's lecture to solve all of them. Um, uh, I believe that's right. Uh, yeah, so number six, you should have enough as of Thursday's lecture to solve that. Um, so um, uh, problem number one, um, uh, it's proving a language is not context-free, so we're gonna introduce a method for doing that. That method is gonna come in handy. Um, for parts B and C, uh, if you look at the problem set, it has this strange looking thing, sigma, 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 in parenthesis, star. It's really just a regular expression that's very simple. Um, you know, you should just make sure you understand that that's a way of representing all strings whose length is a multiple of three. Um, and if I stick a sigma in front of that, it's all strings whose length is one plus a multiple of three. Um, so um, once you understand that, and if you think about what kinds of strings are in the language C2, it'll help you want to understand what happens when you take those unions. Um, and um, parts B and C are not intended to be very hard, um, but you just have to understand what's going on. Uh, problem number two is about ambiguous grammars. I touched on that briefly in lecture. Um, it's enough to solve the problem. Um, the book has a little bit more detail about uh, um, ambiguous languages, uh, ambiguous grammars, uh, ambiguous la grammars, I should say. Um, and uh, so this is a grammar that's supposed to represent a fragment of a programming language, um, you know, with uh, if thens um, and if then elses. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, those kinds of constructs in programming languages. Um, and there is an, a natural ambiguity that comes up in a programming language. You know, if you have, you know, if some condition then statement one, else statement two. I presume you understand what the semantics of that is, what that means. Um, 
And the tricky thing is that if you have a, you know, those statements can themselves be if statements. And so if you have the situation where you have if then and if then else is the, uh, what follows that, the question is where does the else attach? Is it to the second if or to the first if? Um, so that's kind of a big hint on this problem, but that's okay. Um, I think you uh, should, uh, um, uh, you know, you need to take that and figure out how to get a, uh, an actual member of the language, which is ambiguously generated, um, and then show that it has, that show that it is by showing two parse trees. Uh, now, or, or two uh, leftmost derivations. If you read the book, you'll see that's an alternative way of, of representing a parse tree. So, um, and then you, what you're supposed to do is give a grammar for the same language, which is unambiguous. Um, you don't have to prove that it's unambiguous because that's a bit of a chore, but as long as you understand what's going on, you should be, should be able to come up with an unambiguous grammar, which resolves that ambiguity. Um, and I don't have in mind changing the language by introducing new uh, programming languages constructs like a begin end. Uh, that's not in the spirit of this problem because you're, that's a different, it's grammar for a different language. So you need to be generating the same language um, without any other extraneous things going on that are gonna resolve the ambiguity. The ambiguity needs to be resolved within the structure of the grammar itself. So keep that in mind. Uh, for problem number three about the Q automata, um, you know, that came up actually as a suggestion um, uh, last lecture, I believe, or two lectures back. What happens if you take a push down automaton, but instead of a push down, uh, as a, instead of a stack, you add a Q? Um, what happens then? Well, actually, it turns out that the model you get is very powerful and it turns out to be equivalent in power to a Turing machine. So you'll see arguments of that kind today, how you show that. Um, other models are equivalent. No, not today. That's going to be on. Um, uh, that's going to. Be, uh, so I apologize. The Q, this is going to be something that you'll also. You know, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm confusing myself here. Uh, for problems number problem number three, you actually need Thursday le Thursday's lecture as well uh, to really uh, at least see examples of how you do that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, so Thursday. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I'll try to send out a note clarifying this. Uh, by the end of Thursday, you'll be able to do everything uh, except for problem six. And for problem six, you'll need Tuesday's lecture, uh, a week from today's lecture to do. Um, so, uh, um, all right. Uh, so um, problem number four, that one you'll be able to do at the end of today. We'll, that's also gonna, you know, the problem is I'm, <laughs> I'm working on preparing Thursday's lecture too. So I'm getting a little, I'm confusing myself. Uh, problem number four, you'll be able to do after Thursday's lecture. Maybe we should uh, talk about that um, uh, ne uh, next lecture. Um, problem number five, um, you can do today, um, um, but m maybe I'm not going to say anything about that. And problem number six, I won't say anything about either. Okay, so why don't we just jump in then um, and uh, look at today's material. Um, what about seven? Seven is, a, oh, seven is an optional problem. Oh, I, sh I should have mentioned that. Whenever there's, seven is always gonna be an optional. I indicate that with a star. I should have made that clear um, on the actual description here, but seven is optional. Uh, it's just like we had for problem set one. Okay, let's move, let's move on then to, uh, to what we're gonna talk about today. Um, uh, and just a little bit of review. Um, so we talked about the equivalence of context-free grammars and push down automata. As you remember, oops, let me get myself out of the picture here. Um, uh, as we mentioned last time, we actually proved one direction, but the other direction of that, you just have to know it's true, but you don't have to know the proof. The proof is a little bit uh, lengthy, I would say. It's a nice proof, but it's pretty long. Um, and uh, there are two uh, important corollaries to that. Um, if you know what a corollary is, just a simple consequence, which doesn't need much of a proof, uh, sort of a very straightforward consequence. First of all, uh, as I think we pointed out last time, one, one conclusion, one corollary you get is that every regular, regular language is a context-free language because um, a, a finite automaton is a push-down automaton that does, just happens not to use its stack. Um, so immediately you get that every regular language is context-free. And second of all, um, you also immediately get that whenever you have a context-free language and a 
and a regular language, and you take their intersection, you get back a context-free language. Um, so context-free intersect regular is context-free. Okay, that, that's actually mentioned in your homework as well as one of the zero point X problems, um, which I give to try to get you, um, they're not, you don't have to turn those in, but I suggest you look at them. Uh, I don't know how many of you are looking at them, but uh, this is a useful fact. And, and some of those other facts in, in zero point X problems are useful. So I encourage you to look at them. Um, but anyway, intersection of context free and regular is context free. You might ask, what about intersection of context free and context free? Do we have closure under intersection? The answer is no. Um, we do not have closure, closure under intersection. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, so here's the proof sketch for, um, uh, I, I, should, I wanted to say that the intersection of context free and regular, why do we know that's still context free? Because the push down automaton for A can be simulating the finite automaton for B inside its finite control, inside its finite memory. The problem is if you have two context-free languages, you have two pushdown automata, you can't simulate that with one pushdown automaton because it has only a single stack. So if you're trying to take the intersection of two context-free language, languages with only a single stack, you're gonna be in trouble because it's hard to, um, Anyway, I mean, that's not a proof, but at least it shows you what goes wrong if you try to do the obvious thing. Um, okay, uh, so, uh, so if, if it, and just here's an important point that I was trying to make before, if A and B are both context-free and you take the intersection, uh, the result may not necessarily be a context-free uh, language. Um, so the, the class of context-free languages is not closed under inter intersection. We'll, we'll comment on that uh, uh, in a bit. Um, the context-free languages are closed under the regular operations, however, union, intersection, a uh, union, concatenation, and star. So you should um, feel comfortable that you know how to prove that. It's in the, again, it's, it's one of the, uh, I think it's problem 0.2. Um, and I think the solution is even given in the book for it. So you, you just should know how to prove that. Um, uh, not very, pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so let's move on then uh, to, uh, to really basically conclude our um, work on context-free languages and to understand the limitations of uh, context-free grammars and what kinds of languages may not be context free and how do you prove that? So how do you prove that for some language there is no grammar? Um, again, you know, it's not enough just to say, you know, uh, give an informal um, uh, comment that, well, yeah, I, I couldn't think of a grammar that, uh, or some, some things of that kind, that's not gonna be good enough. We need to have a proof. Uh, so if we take the language here, zero to the K, one to the K, two to the K, so those are strings, which are runs of zeros, followed by an equal number of ones, followed by an equal number of twos. So just zeros, then ones, then twos, all the same length. Um, uh, that's a, a language which is not gonna be a context-free language. And we'll, we'll, we'll give a method for proving that. You know, if you had a stack, you can match the ones with the zeros, but then once you're done with that, the stack is empty. And how do you now make sure that the number of twos uh, corresponds to the number of ones that you had. So again, that, that's an informal argument that's not good enough to, uh, to, to be a proof, but it sort of gives an intuition. Um, so we're gonna give a method for proving um, non-context-free, uh, languages are not context-free, using again, um, a pumping lemma, uh, but this is gonna be a pumping lemma that applies to context-free languages, not to regular languages. Okay, it looks very similar but it has some extra wrinkles thrown in um, because the other older uh, pumping lemma was specific to the regular languages. And this is gonna be something that applies to the context-free languages. Okay, so now um, let's just read it and then we'll um, try to interpret it again. It's very similar in spirit. Basically it says that whenever you have a context-free language, all long strings in the language can be pumped in some kind of way, so it's gonna be a little different kind of pumping than we had before, um, and you stay in the language. Okay, so uh, 
before we broke the string into three pieces where we could repeat that center piece as many times as, as you like um, and you stay in the language. Here, we're gonna end up breaking the, um, the string into five pieces. So S is gonna be broken up into U, V, X, Y, Z. Um, uh, and the and the way it's gonna work here, so he, here is a picture. So all long strings, again, there's gonna be a threshold um, for whenever you have a language, there's gonna be a, some cutoff length uh, so that all the longer strings in that language can be pumped and you stay in the language, but the shorter strings, there's no guarantee. Um, so if you have a long string in the language, length at least this pumping length P, um, then you can break it up into five pieces. But now it's that, uh, second and fourth string that are gonna play that special uh, pumping role, um, which means that what you can do is you can repeat those um, and you stay in the language. And it's important that you repeat them both, that V and that Y the same number of times. So you're gonna have a picture that looks something like this. Um, and that is going to, you, you repeat, uh, so you, get, you can get, you re, if you repeat the V and you repeat the Y, you get U, V, V, X, Y, Y, Z. Um, or if you look at over here, it would be U, V squared, X, Y squared, Z. Um, and that's going to st still be in the language. Um, and then we have, so that's one condition. We'll have to look at all of these conditions when we do the proof. But we just want to understand what the statement is right now. So the second condition is that V and Y together cannot be empty. And really that's another way of saying they can't both be the empty string. Because if they were both the empty string, then repeating them wouldn't change um, S. And then of course it would stay in the language. So it would be kind of meaningless if they were allowed to be empty. And the last thing is again going to be there as a matter of convenience for proving, pr proving uh, languages are not context free because you have to make sure there's no possible way of cutting up the string um, when you're trying to prove a language is not con context free. You have to show the pumping fails. And then you, it's, it's gonna be helpful sometimes to limit the ways in which the string can be cut up because then you have, it's an easier job for you to work with it. Um, so here it's a little different than before, but sort of similar that V, X, Y combined um, as a substring. So I think I show that over here. Yeah, VXY together is a um, is not too long. So the VXY maybe it's better seen up here is going to be is going to be at most p. Um, we'll we'll do an example in a minute of using this. Okay. So again, here's our pumping lemma. I've just rest restated it, so um, you know we have it in front of us. And we're going to do a proof. I'm just going to give you the idea of the proof first, and then we'll go through some of the details. The idea is actually pretty simple. Okay, I give it a call a proof by picture. Again, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that we have this context-free language, A, and now all long strings in A have this pumping quality that you can break them up into five pieces so that the second and the fourth piece can be repeated and you stay in the language. So how do we know that that's gonna be true? Let's take a look at the proof here. And how, how, why is that going to be true? So first of all, I, I, I'd like to do it qualitatively rather than quantitatively. So let's just imagine, instead of what thinking, we'll, we'll calculate what P is later. But just imagine the S is some really, really long string. That's the way I like to think about it. So S is just really long. What is that going to tell us? It's going to tell us something important about um, the way the grammar produces S, which is gonna be useful in, in getting a, a way of pumping, pumping S. So if S is really long, um, we're gonna look at the parse tree for S and we're gonna conclude that the parse tree has to be really tall because it's impossible for a very shallow parse tree to generate a very long string. And again, we'll quantify that in a second, but intuitively, I think that's not too hard to see why that ought to be true. So if you have a long S, the, pole, the, the parse tree has to be really tall because the parse tree can't generate very many, it can't expand by very much at each level. 
So we'll look at how much it can expand, but it depends on the grammar. How much expansion can we have at each level? And it's gonna be, you can't have just in three levels, you know, some small grammar generating a string of length a million. It just, you know, you'll see that that's just impossible. So once you know that the, the parse tree is really tall here, um, then you're actually almost done. Because what does it mean to be really tall? It means that there's some path starting at the start variable E, I'm calling it, uh, in this parse tree, which goes down to some um, terminal symbol in S, which goes through many steps. That's what it means for the tree to be very tall. And each one of those steps is a variable until you get down to the very end. Okay, so that's the way parse trees look. You keep expanding variables until you get to a terminal. So here's the, here you get some, some path that's really a long path. And once you have a long path that have many, many variables appearing on here, well, the grammar itself has only some fixed number of variables in it. So you're gonna to have to have a repetition co coming among the variables that occur on that long path. Got that? So a long string forces a tall parse tree, forces a repetition on some path coming out of the start variable. Uh, of some, of some uh, other variable that, that comes out. Now, that's going to tell us how to cut up S. Because if you look at the subtrees of S that those two R variables are generating, shown like this, I'm going to use that. So if you, if you have to follow what I'm saying here. So, you know, the R here is generating this portion of S, and the lower R is generating a smaller portion of S. Um, just looking at the subtree that you get here. Um, and that's gonna tell us that we can cut up S um, accordingly. So U is that very first part out here, generated by E, but not by the first R. R is generated, V is generated by the first R, but not by the second R. The second R generates exactly X, and then we have Y and Z similarly. So that all follows from having a, a tall parse tree. And now we're finished. Now we know how to cut up S. How do we know we can repeat uh, V and Y and still be in the language? Well, I'll actually show you, in, show you that you're in the language by exhibiting a parse tree with a string U, V, V, X, Y, Y, Z. Here it is. What I'm gonna get that parse tree by when I expand this lower R Instead of expanding it to get X, I'm going to follow the same substitutions that I, I had when I expanded the upper R. So it's as if I took this larger subtree here and I substituted it in for the smaller uh, subtree under, under the second R. And so that I get a picture that looks like this. So here I'm substituting under the second R the same subtree that I had originally coming out of the upper R the first R. And so now this parse tree is generating the string U, V, V, X, Y, Y, Z, which is what I'm looking for. And of course, you can do that again and again, and you're going to keep getting higher and higher exponents of V and Y. Um, and in fact, you can even get the zero exponent, which means that V and Y both disappear altogether. And for that, you do something slightly different, which is that you replace the larger subtree by the smaller subtree. Okay, so here, which was originally that larger subtree generating VXY, I stick instead the smaller subtree, I do the substitutions from the smaller subtree, and I just get X uh, there. And so now the string I generated is UXZ, which is the same as UV to the zero, XY to the zero Z. Okay, and that's, that is the idea of the proof. Now, I think, uh, you could work out um, the, the, the quantities that you need in order to drive this proof. Um, I'm going to do that for you. I actually hate writing down lots of inequalities and um, uh, equations and so on on the board because I think they're just almost incomprehensible to follow. At least they would be for me. But I'm going to put them up there just for completeness sake. Um, uh, so here we're going to give the details of this proof on the next, uh, the next slide here. 
Uh, oh yeah, so I just wanna give a name to this. I'm gonna call this the cutting and pasting argument because I'm cutting apart pieces of this parse tree and I'm pasting them in to other places within the parse tree to get new strings being generated. So this is a cutting and pasting argument. So, okay, let's, let's take a look at the details here. Um, uh, just so we have to understand, well, how big does P actually need to be in order for this thing to kick in? Um, well, first of all, we have to understand how fast that parse tree can be growing um, as we go level to level. And that's going to be dependent on how big the right-hand side sides of rules are. I mean, that's that really tells you how many, what's the fan out, you know, of each node? Uh, what's the maximum fan out? And that's going to be the maximum uh, length of a right-hand side of any rule. So, for example, in that other grammar we had seen last time uh, for arithmetic expressions, we had this e goes to e plus t and uh, this rule here, and in terms of the parse tree, that would look uh, like an, a, a little element like that. And that's actually the longest right-hand side that you can get. And so the parse tree can be growing by a factor of three each time. Now that's going to tell us how big the string uh, needs to be that's being generated. What is the value of P in order to get a, a high enough parse tree so that you're going to get a repeated variable. Okay, um, let's call the height of the parse tree for S H. Okay, um, so now if you, this is just repeating what I just said, if you have a tree of height H and the maximum branching is B, then you get at most B to the H leaps because each level you get another factor of B coming up. So that's how much branching you have. So each node at one level can become B nodes at the next level down. So you're multiplying by B each time and if you have H levels, you're gonna have B to the H leaves. So the length of S, which are really the leaves here, it is at most B to the H. The reason why it's at most and not exactly is you might be doing some substitutions which are shorter right-hand sides. Um, okay, so to try to show this as a picture here, uh, pulling that same picture we had before, we want H, the height, to be bigger than the number of variables to force a repetition. So the number of variables is gonna be written this way. V is the variables, uh, V with bars around it is gonna be the number of variables, and we want that height to be greater than the number of variables. So once you know how high you want that tree to be in order to force the repetition, then it tells you how big S has to be. So V has to be bigger than B to the V, V to the size of V. Um, because then um, the, the, the height that you're going to get is going to be greater than uh, uh, the size of V, which is, uh, so that's what you want. You want H to be greater than the size of V. Uh, so you're going to set P to be one more than B to the V. And so if S is at least that length, this whole thing is going to kick in and you're going to get that repeated variable. Um, uh, so let P to be that value where V is the number of variables in the grammar. And so if S is at least P, which is greater than B to the V, then the, the length of S is gonna be greater than um, B to the V. So H is gonna be what you want to make this thing work. I, you know, if you don't follow that, those inequalities, I sympathize with you. I would never follow that either in a lecture. So, um, but I hope you get the idea. Um, but you know, we're not quite finished yet because what I want to now circle back as, and look at these three conditions and make sure that we've captured them all because actually it's not totally uh, obvious um, uh, in each of those cases that we've got them. Um, so there's a few, a few extra things we need to do. Um, um, okay, so this is concluding the argument. You, there are going to be at least V plus one variables and the longest path, so there's going to be a repetition. So now let's go back here and see. Now that we have this picture with a repeated uh, variable, how do we know we can get condition one? Well, that's just the cutting and pasting argument from the previous slide. How do we know that V and Y are not both empty? Well, actually, that's not totally obvious because it's possible that when you generated V here and you generated Y, um, maybe 
going from this R to that R, you got nothing new. You know, it could have been that R got replaced by T, another variable with nothing new coming out, and then T got replaced by R. So you, you substituted, uh, you know, T for R and then R for T, and you got nothing new coming out. And in that case, uh, V and Y would both be the empty string, and that would violate what we want. Um, the way you get around that, and these are details here. If you're not totally following these points, don't worry. Uh, but I do want to just try to, it's easy, they're easy to describe, so I figure let me present the whole thing in full detail. Um, uh, so if going from this R to that R doesn't generate anything new, you're getting exactly the same things coming out, V and Y are just uh, are empty, are the empty string. Um, how do we avoid that from happening? Well, what there's a simple way to, address that, which is to say, uh, if you have the string s, when you take a parse tree, make sure you take a smallest possible parse tree. You cannot, you're not allowed to start off with an inefficient parse tree that can be shortened and still generate s. I want the smallest possible parse tree. And that smallest possible parse tree can't have an r going to another r which is generating nothing new, because then you could always have, have eliminated that step and you would still have a parse tree for S, but it would be a smaller parse tree. So that would be, I want you to start off with a, the smallest possible parse tree, and then you're gonna be guaranteed that V or Y is gonna be something uh, non-empty. So that takes care of uh, condition two. Condition three, uh, you know, how do we know that V, X, Y together is not very long? And basically it's the same argument all over again. Um, you just wanna make sure that when you're picking the repetition R, the two R's here, you pick the lowest possible repetitions that occur if you have many, many choices. And those lowest two, those lowest repetitions, there's not gonna be any lower repetition here. And then by the same argument, um, the, the uh, since once you have that very first R, there's no more repetitions occurring below, uh, the VXY can't be very long um, because uh, that would again force another repetition to occur. Um, so anyway, those are the three conditions and uh, that's the proof of the pumping lemma for context-free languages. Let's see how we use that. Um, okay, so let's do an example of proving a language not context-free using the pumping lemma. Uh, how are you going to do go about doing that? Because that's the kind of thing you, you know, at the very least, you need to know how to do this in order to do the homework. Um, uh, I'd like to motivate you that the stuff is so interesting and fun, but it doesn't work for everybody. So <laughs> uh, for you practical people out there, um, pay attention so you can do the homework. Okay, let's go back to that language we had at the, uh, a couple of slides back, zero to the K, one to the K, two to the K. It's not a context-free language. We're going to show that now using the pumping lemma for context-free languages. Um, uh, so it's going to do similar to the proofs using for non-regular, non-regular, non non-regular languages, um, proof by contradiction. So you first you assume the language is context-free, and then we're going to apply the pumping lemma, um, and then we're going to get a contradiction. Uh, so the pumping lemma gives that pumping length as we described above. And now we just wanna pick a longer string in the language and show that that longer string, which is supposed to be pumpable and stay in the language, in fact, is not pumpable. Um, so the pumping lemma says that you can divide it into five pieces satisfying the three conditions. Uh, condition three implies uh, that, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through the, I'm gonna, uh, show you get a contradiction. So condition three implies that you cannot contain both zeros and let, let, let's pull up a picture here. So here is S, uh, zeros, ones, and then twos, all of the same length. Condition three, uh, so if you break it up, condition three says V, X, Y together cannot be too long. Well, if V, X, Y together is not too long, um, what, you know, how could it be that when you're repeating V and Y, you stay in the language. Uh, for one thing, you can't have zeros, ones, and twos all occurring within V, X, and Y. Um, some, uh, some symbol is going to get left out. 
So then when you pump up, you're going to have unequal numbers of symbols. And so you're going to be out of the language. Um, okay, so no matter how you try to cut it up, uh, following condition three, which is one of the things that restricts the, uh, the ways to cut it up, you're going to end up, when you pump up, uh, going out of the language. And so, um, therefore, it's not in D. D is wrong. Uh, B, should say B. Can I, can I, can I, can I, hmm. Supposed to be a little right on this thing. I guess not. I didn't test that. <laughs> oh, well, that's supposed to be a B. Um, uh, so B is a context-free language. We include, uh, so that's the assumption that B is a context-free language. That's false. So when we conclude that's not a context-free language. Okay. Let's do, uh, Oh yeah, I have a check in here. Um, so let's see um, what we're going to. We're going to. I'm going to ask you to think about. Okay, my head is blocking part of the text. Oh, that was a while ago. Um, okay. Uh, yes. So uh, just one question, by the way, in, in terms of applying the, um, in, in, in the pumping lemma, either V or Y can be uh, empty, but not both. But anyway, let's get to this check in here. Um, so let's look at these two languages, A1 and A2, which look very similar to B, but a little different. Um, so it's A1 is zero to the K1 to the K2 to the L, where K and L could be any numbers any positive, non, you know, uh, non-negative numbers. So basically what this says saying is that the number of zeros and ones are going to be equal, but the number of twos can be anything. Whereas A2, similar, um, but here we're requiring the number of two, ones and twos to be equal, and the number of zeros can be anything. Okay? Now you can easily make, I hope, uh, you should make sure you, you can, push down automata that can recognize A1 and A2. Um, because let's just take A1. The push down automaton can push the zeros uh, as it's reading them, po pop them as it's reading the ones to match them off and make sure that they're the same number of them. And then the twos, it doesn't care how many there are. It just has to make sure that there are no strings, there are no letters coming out of order. But the, any number of twos is fine. So you can easily make a push down automaton recognize A1, similarly for A2. Um, so what can we conclude from that? Here are the three possibilities. Let me uh, so look at that. The class of context free language not closer inter intersection. You know, you can read it. Um, so I, I, I want to pull up the uh, poll and launch that. Please fill that out. Um, 10 seconds. Again, just, if you don't know the answer, just give any answer so that, uh, cause we're not counting correctness. Um, still a few dribbling in. Okay. Uh, five seconds. Okay. And polling. Uh, most of you got that right. Um, I don't know, is it okay to share these things? I don't want to make people who didn't get it right feel bad. Um, you know, but you should understand, I think, you know, if you're missing something, you should understand what is what you're missing. The pumping lemma shows that A1 union A2 is not a context-free language. No, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the context-free languages are closed under union. So the pumping lemma had better not show that these, we already know that these two languages are context-free because we get them from pushdown automata. Uh, and we said at the beginning that context-free language is closed under union. So we know that these two are context-free. So the pumping lemma better not show it. They're not context-free. Something would be terribly gone, have gone terribly wrong uh, if that were true. And also, um, uh, we know also from a little bit of further reasoning that the context-free languages is not closed under complement by what we've already, what we've already discussed uh, because they are closed under union, and as I pointed out, they're not closed under intersection. And so if they were closed under complement, 
De Morgan's laws would say that closure under union and closure under complement would give you closure under intersection. But they, we don't have closure under intersection. So in fact, they're not closed under complement. Okay, uh, so in fact, this does show us that the class of context-free language is not closed under intersection because the intersection of A1 and A2, two context-free languages, is B. And B is not context-free. So it shows that um, this is not, the, the um, closure under intersection does not hold. Okay, um, so let us continue then. Um, uh, we have one more uh, example, then we'll take a break. Uh, so the pumping lemma for context-free languages, again, uh, here's a second example. Uh, here's the language F. We have actually seen what's before. WW, uh, two copies of a string, um, in, in, uh, um, that, uh, two copies of any string. Um, and we're going to show that's not a context-free language. Uh, assume that it is context-free. The pu pumping lemma gives the pumping length. Now here you have to do a little bit more work. Often the challenge in applying the pumping lemma in either case uh, that we've seen uh, involves with choosing that string that you need to pump, that you're going to pump. So you have to choose S uh, in F, which is longer than P, which S to go with. So you might try this one first glance. Here is a string that's in the language because it's two copies of the string zero to the P1, zero to, and then zero to the P1. That's in the language. But it's a bad choice. Uh, let, let's say, let's before I get ahead of myself, let's let's draw a picture of S, which I think is always helpful to see. Um, so here is runs of zeros and then a one, runs of zeros and then a one. Um, why is this a bad choice? Because you can pump that string and you remain in the language. Um, there is a way to cut that string up, um, and you'll stay in the language. And the way to cut it up is to let the X be just that substring, which is just the one. And the V and the Y can be a couple of zeros or a single zero on either side of that one. And now that's gonna be a small VXY, but if you repeat V and Y, you're going to, um, uh, um, if you repeat V and Y, you're gonna stay in the language because you'll just be adding zeros here. You'll be adding same number of zeros there and then you're gonna have a, a string which still looks like WW and you'll still be in the language. Um, so that, that means of cutting it up doesn't get you out of the language uh, under pumping. Um, and, and the fact is that um, that's a bad choice for S because there is that way of cutting it up. So you have to show there's no way, you can't, you don't get to pick the way to cut it up. Um, you have to show that there is no way to cut it up um, uh, in order to, um, to violate the, uh, the pumping lemma. So in, if instead you use the string zero to the P one to the P zero to the P one to the P, so this is zeros followed by ones, followed by zeros, followed by ones, all the same uh, number of them, that can't be pumped satisfying the, th the three conditions. Um, and just going through that, uh, um, now if you try to break it up, you're gonna lose, or the, or the lemma's gonna lose. You're, you're going to be happy, but the lemma is not going to be happy uh, because it's not going to, it's going to violate the conditions. Um, uh, condition three says um, VXY is not, doesn't span too much. And in fact, can't span uh, two runs of zeros or two runs of ones. It's just not big enough because they're more than P things, they're P things apart. And this one string, this string VXY is only P long. And so therefore, if you repeat uh, uh, V and Y, you're gonna have two runs of zeros or two runs of ones that have unequal length. And now that's not gonna be of the form WW and you're gonna be out of the language. Okay, uh, so I hope you know, that's, uh, you've gotten a little practice with that. Um, I think we're at our uh, break and I will see you back here in uh, five uh, minutes. Um, if I can get my timer launched here. Okay, so see you soon. You can, this is a good time, by the way, to, to um, uh, message me or the TAs, and I'll, I'll try to be uh, looking for, if you have any questions. In the pumping lemma, can X, be, yeah, X can be epsilon in the pumping lemma. 
but it's not possible. X can be epsilon, Y can be epsilon, but X and Y cannot be both, cannot both be epsilon. Because then when you pump, you will get nothing new. Uh, technically V and Y can include both zeros and ones. Yeah, V and Y can include both zeros and ones. Um, so, let me uh, try to put that back if that's will. will. Um, uh, so V and Y can have both zeros and ones, but they can't have zeros from two different blocks. And you can't have ones from two different blocks. So what's gonna happen is either you're gonna get things out of order when you repeat, uh, like a V has both zeros and ones in it. When you repeat V, you're gonna have uh, zeros and ones and zeros and ones and zeros and ones. That's clearly out of the language. So that's, so that's no good. Your only hope is to have V to be sticking only inside the zeros and Y to be sticking only inside zeros or only inside ones. Uh, but now if you repeat that, if you just look at what you're gonna get, you're gonna have a string which is gonna be, um, if you try to cut that string in half, it's not gonna be of the right form. It's not gonna be two copies of the same string because you know, it's gonna have a, a run of zeros um, followed by a longer or shorter run of zeros or one of ones followed by another run of ones of unequal length. So there's no way this can be two strings, um, two copies of the same string. Because that, that's what you required. F has to be two copies of the same string to be in the language. Okay, uh, let me just see. We're, we're running out of time here. Let me just put my, uh, um, my, my timer here. We've only got 30 seconds. And I'm sorry, I'm not getting to answer all the questions here. Um, Okay, we are done um, uh, with um, our break. It's gonna come back. Um, and now we're shifting gears in a major way because in a sense, everything we've done so far has been kind of a warm up. Um, these limited computational models um, really are kind of, Get, helping us to set our understanding of automata and the definitions and the notation. Um, and they're also gonna be helpful in providing examples later on in the term. Um, but really in terms of a model of computation, they don't cut it because uh, they cannot do very simple things that we normally think of a computer as being able to do. So here we're introducing a, another model of computation called the Turing machine. And that's really going to be the model that we're gonna stick with for the rest of the semester, because that's gonna be our model of a general purpose uh, computer, the way you normally think about it. Um, so let's, uh, we'll spend a little time introducing it and then we will, um, uh, you know, we'll, 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 have, we'll continue that discussion next time. Um, so uh, in terms of a schematic, actually, the Turing machine model is pretty simple. Um, it has a, uh, uh, it has, um, it's gonna have states and all that stuff, but you know, though, so there's gonna be a finite control here, which is gonna include states and transition function as we'll describe in a minute. Um, the point is, is that, you know, it's gonna have the input appearing on a tape. Uh, the key difference now is that the, the machine is going to be able to change the symbols on the tape. Um, and so we think of the machine as being able to write as well as read the tape. Okay, so that's really uh, the key uh, feature um, of a Turing machine is the ability to write on the tape. Everything else in a sense follows from that. There are a few other differences. Um, but uh, so the fact that the he he head can read and write um, so we can use the tape as storage, much as we use the stack as storage, but it doesn't, it's not limited in the way we can access it, uh, the way a stack is. So we kind of have very uh, flexible access of the information on the tape. Now, um, being able to write on the tape doesn't do any good if you can't go back and read what you've written later on. 
So we're going to make the head to be able to be two-way. So the head can move left to right as before, but it can also move back left. Uh, and that's going to be under control of the transition function. So under, under program control, essentially. Uh, the tape is going to be, oops, sorry. The tape is infinite to the right. Um, and uh, so we're not going to limit how much storage the machine can have. So the tape is going to we'll think of as having, instead of just having the input on it, it's going to have the input, but then the rest, it's going to have infinitely many blanks, blank symbols following the input. So the tape is uh, infinite or, or to, to it in the right, right hand direction. Um, and uh, so there's infinitely many blanks. I'm going to use that symbol for the blank to follow the input. Um, you can accept or reject. Oh yeah, so that's another thing that's important. Normally we think of, in the previous machines, finite automata, push down automata, when you got to the end of the input, that's when you the acceptance or rejection was decided. If you were in an accept state at the end of the input, then you accepted, but uh, you have to be in that location um, at the end of the input in order for that to take effect. That doesn't make any sense anymore because um, the machine might go off beyond that and still be computing and come back and read uh, the tape later on. So it only really makes sense to let the machine accept or reject at, upon entering the accept or the reject state. So we're gonna have a special accept state and a special reject state, which is also a little different than before. Um, and when the machine enters those states, then the machine, then the action takes effect. The machine, it's all, those machine halts and then accepts or holds and then rejects. So we'll, we'll make that absolutely clear in the formal definition in a second, but just to get the spirit of it. Um, so I'm gonna give you uh, an example of the thing running. Uh, sorry, I need to, again, my PowerPoint is having issues. Um, uh, okay, so here is a, a Turing machine recognizing that language B. Actually, I switched gears on you. Instead of zeros, ones, and twos, I made them A's, B's, and C's, but same idea. Um, uh, so I'm gonna show you how the Turing machine operates, um, and then we'll give a formal uh, definition. I hope that's on here. <laughs> uh, I think it is, um, in a second. But let's, this is an informal discussion of how the machine is gonna operate. To do this language, A to the K, B to the K, C to the K, using its ability to write on the tape as well as read and move its head in both directions. Okay, so let me just first describe um, in English how this um, machine operates and then we will um, uh, see it in action on this little uh, picture I have over here. Okay, so the way the machine is gonna operate is the very first thing is the head is gonna start here and the head is gonna scan off to the right, uh, making sure that the symbols appear in the correct order. So it's seeing that, that there are A's and then B's and then C's without checking the quantities, just that the order is correct. For that, you don't need to write. A finite automaton can check that the input is of the form A star, B star, C star. Um, so uh, writing is not necessary. The machine, if it uh, detects symbols out of order, it immediately rejects by going into a special reject state. Otherwise, it's gonna return its head back to the left end and um, uh, let me just show that here. So here is it, oh no, uh, I better, before I illustrate it over here, let's go through the whole algorithm. Uh, so the next thing that happens is you're gonna scan right, and now you wanna do the counting. So you're gonna scan right again, but this time you're gonna make a bunch of passes over the input, a bunch of scans. And each time you make a scan, you're gonna cross off one symbol of each type. So you're gonna cross off an A, you'll cross off a B, you'll cross off a C on a single scan, and then you repeat that. Crossing off the next A, the next B, the next C. And you wanna make sure that you've crossed off all of the symbols on the same run and not crossing off some symbols before other symbols, uh, while other symbols still remain, because that would mean that the counts were not equal. If you cross them off and they're all, you know, run out on the same scan, same pass, then we know that the numbers had to be start, start off being equal. Sort of, I mean, this is sort of baby stuff here, I, I, but I hope you get the idea. And we'll, we'll kind of illustrate it in, in a second. So if at least one of the, if you have the last one of each symbol, so what I mean by that is you, you just,
crossed off the last A, the last B, and the last C, then you know that you were originally had an equal number and so you accept because you're crossing off one of each on each scan. So if you cross the, the, on the last scan, each one of them gets crossed off, um, then you accept. Uh, but if uh, it was the last of some symbol but not of other symbols, so you know you crossed off the last A but there, um, there were several Bs remaining, then you started off with an unequal number of A's, B's, and C's. And you can reject. Or if all symbols still remain after you've crossed them uh, one of each off, then you haven't ha done enough passes and you're gonna repeat from uh, stage three and do that uh, again, another scan. Okay, so here's uh, a little um, animation which shows this happening on this diagram. So here is the very first stage where you're scanning across, making sure things are in the right order. Um, didn't have to write on the tape. And now you're gonna re reset the, the head back to the beginning. Uh, this is, the, by the way, not the most efficient procedure for doing this. Um, so um, uh, um, now, the, now we're gonna do a scan, crossing off a, a single A, a single B, and a single C. So here, I'm gonna show that here. Single A, single B, single C. And now as soon as you've crossed off that last C, we can return back to the beginning. Um, so scan right, cross. Uh, uh, so if all symbols remain, so there are still symbols remaining of each type, we're gonna to return to the left and repeat and repeat. Now we're gonna another pass, single A, single B, single C get crossed off. We have we crossed them all off yet. No, there's of each type, there still are remaining ones. So again, we return back to the beginning. Now we have a last pass, cross off the last A, the last B, the last C, the last one of each type was crossed off. So now we know we can accept because the original string was in the language. Okay, so that's uh, to give you at least some idea um, that how the Turing machine can operate, you know, more like the way you would think of a computer operating, you know, maybe it's very primitive, you know, you, you could imagine counting also, and a Turing machine can count as well. But this is the simplest uh, descript, uh, procedure that I can just describe on, um, you know, uh, for you without getting making it too complicated. Um, okay, so let's do a little check in on that. Um, okay, so the way I'm describing this, how do we, how do you think and you, in a sense, you don't quite know enough yet, but um, uh, how do you think we're gonna get this effect of crossing off with the Turing machine? Um, are we gonna get that by changing the model and adding that ability to cross off to the model? Um, are we gonna use a tape alphabet that includes those crossed off symbols among them? Or um, we'll just assume that all Turing machines come with an eraser and they can always cross off stuff. Um, so what do you think is the nice way sort of mathematically to describe um, this uh, uh, this ability to cross things off? Yeah, again, again most of your, again, I think are getting this. Um, uh, so, there are like 10 laggards here, so please wrap it up um, so we can close the poll. Uh, five seconds to go. Um, okay, polling ending. Get your last, last call. Uh, all right, share the results. So most of you, uh, got that right. All Turing machines come with an eraser. I don't know, that was thrown in there as a joke, but it got, came in second. So I <laughs> don't feel bad if you got it, but that's not what I had in mind. Um, the, the way the Turing machine is gonna be writing on the tape is to write a crossed off symbol uh, instead of the, uh, the symbol that was originally there. So we're gonna add these new crossed off symbols and that's gonna be a common thing for us to do in, um, you know, when we uh, design Turing machines. We're not gonna get down to the implementation level for very long. We're gonna very quickly shift to a higher level of uh, discussion about the machines. But anyway, that's how you would do it if you were gonna actually build a machine. 
Okay, so um, let us then look at the formal definition. It occurs to me maybe I should have done that check in after the formal definition, that might have been clearer, but oh well. Uh, Okay, here's the formal definition. This time a Turing machine is a seven tuple. Um, and there is a, uh, um, now here uh, we have sigma, which is the input alphabet. Gamma is the tape alphabet. So now you're, it's sort of a little bit analogous to the stack from before where gamma was the stack alphabet, but these are the symbols that you're allowed to write on the tape. Um, or that are allowed to be on the tape. Um, so uh, obviously all of the input symbols are among the uh, tape uh, symbols uh, because they can appear on the tape. So you have sigma is a subset of gamma. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention here is that the input alphabet, uh, we don't allow the blank symbol to be uh, in the input alphabet so that um, you can actually use the blank symbol as a delimiter for the end of the input. Um, a marker for the end of the input. Um, so uh, in fact, and the blank symbol is always going to be in the tape alphabet. Uh, so we have, um, you know, the, the, this is actually always going to be a proper subset uh, because of the blank symbol. Um, but we're just allowing, doesn't really matter, we're allowing the tape alphabet to have other symbols for convenience. So for example, these crossed off symbols. Now let's look at what the transition function, uh, how that operates. So the transition function, remember, tells how the machine is actually doing its computation. And it says that if you're in a certain state and the head is looking at a certain tape symbol, um, then you can go to a new state. You write a new symbol on the, uh, at that location on the tape and you can move the head either left or right. So that's how we get the effect of the head being able to be bidirectional. Um, and here's the writing on the tape, comes up right here. So, you know, just an example here, we says that if we're in state Q and the head is looking at an A currently on the tape, then we can move to state R, we change it A to a B and we move the head right, one, one square. Okay. Um, uh, uh, now, here, this is important. To, on, when you're given a, a certain input, here to the Turing machine, it may compute around for a while, moving its head back and forth as we were showing, and it may eventually halt by either entering the Q accept state or the Q reject state, which I didn't uh, bring out here, but that's important. These are the accepting, rejecting special states of the machine. Um, or the machine may never enter one of those. It may just go on and on and on and never halt. We call that looping. Uh, a little bit of a misnomer because this looping imp implies some sort of a repetition. For us, looping just means not halting. Um, and um, so therefore M has three possible outcomes for each um, input um, W. It might accept W by uh, entering uh, the accept state. It could reject W by entering the re reject state, which means it's going to reject it by halting. Or we also say we can reject by looping. You can reject a string by running forever. Um, okay, that's just the terminology that's common uh, in the subject. So you either accept it um, by halting and accepting or rejecting it by either halting and rejecting or by just going forever. That's also considered to be rejecting sort of sort of rejecting in a sense by default. If you never actually have accepted it, then it's going to be rejected. Um, okay, uh, check in three here. All right. So now, um, our last check in for the day, we say this Turing machine model is deterministic. Um, I'm just saying that, but if you look at uh, um, the way we set it up, if you've been following these formal definitions so far, you would understand why it's deterministic. So let's just, as a way of checking that, um, how would we change this definition? Because we will look on, at the next lecture at non-deterministic Turing machines. So a little bit of a lead into that. How would we change this uh, definition to make it a non-deterministic Turing machine? Wh which of those three options would we uh, use? Um, so here, I'll launch that poll. Uh, uh, Got about 10 people left. 
Let's give them another 10 seconds. Um, okay, I think that's everybody who's answered it from before. Um, yeah, there is, so here, uh, I think you pretty much, almost all of you have gotten the right idea. Uh, it is B, in fact, uh, because when we have the power set symbol here, that means there might be several, there's a subset of possibilities. So set, that indicates several different ways to go. Um, uh, and that's what the, that's the essence of non-determinism. Okay, so uh, I think we're, uh, whoops, um, okay. All right, so look, this is also kind of setting us up for next lecture and where we're gonna be going with this. Um, so these are uh, basically two, in a sense, well, two or three important definitions here. Um, one is um, we have, we talked about the regular languages from finite automata. We talked about the context-free languages from the grammars and the pushdown automata. What are the languages of that the Turing machines can do? Um, those are called, in this course anyway, Turing recognizable languages. This is very or T recognizable. Um, those are the lang those are the languages that the Turing machine can recognize. And so, what, just to make sure we are, we're on the same page on this, uh, the language of the machine is the collection of strings that the machine accepts. So the things that are not in the language are the things that are rejected, either by looping or by halting and rejecting. So only the, only the ones that are accepted are the, is the language. Every machine has just a single language. It's the language of all strings that that machine accepts. Um, and we'll say that M recognize that language, if that language is the, uh, the collection of such strings that are accepted. And uh, we will call that language a Turing recognizable language. Okay, if there's some Turing machine that can recognize. Um, now, uh, this feature of being able to reject by running forever is a little bit weird, perhaps. Um, uh, and uh, for, from the standpoint of practicality, uh, it's more convenient if the machine always makes a decision to accept or reject in a finite time and doesn't just reject by going forever. And so we're gonna bring out a special class of Turing machines that have that feature, that they always halt. They always go to the halting states, by the way, maybe I didn't say this explicitly, are the Q accept and the Q reject states. The re accept and reject states are the halting states. So if the machine halts, that means it ends up in one of those two. So it has made a decision of accepting or rejecting in, in, by the, at the point in which it has halted. Um, so we'll say a machine is a decider if it always halts on every input. Uh, so for every W feed in, the machine is eventually going to come to a Q accept or a Q reject. We call such a machine a decider. And now we're going to say a language uh, is it, so we will say that the machine decides a language if, if it's the language of the machine, so the collection of accepted strings, uh, and the machine is a decider. So we'll say that instead of just recognizing the language, we'll say that it decides the language. Um, and a Turing decidable language is a language um, that the machine uh, of all strings the machine accepts uh, for some Turing machine which is, is a decider, which is a Turing machine that always holds. So if a Turing machine may sometimes reject by looping, then it's only recognizing this language. If the Turing machine is always halting, so it's always rejecting by explicitly coming to a reject state and halting, then we'll say it's actually deciding the language. So then in a sense, that's better. And we're gonna distinguish between those two because um, they're not the same. Uh, there are some languages which can be recognized but not decided. And so, uh, in fact, we're going to get the following picture here, that the Turing recognizable languages are a proper subset. They include all the, everything that's decidable certainly is going to be recognizable because, um, uh, you know, a being a decider is an additional restriction to impose, additional requirement. 
Um, so everything that's decidable is going to be automatically recognizable. But there are things which are recognizable, but you're not decidable, as we'll see. Um, I'll actually give an example of that, but not prove it next lecture. And just, for, just to complete out this picture, um, I'm going to uh, uh, also point out, we haven't proven this yet, but uh, we uh, will prove it, um, that the decidable languages also include all the context-free languages, which in, in turn include the regular languages, as it was already seen. So we haven't shown this inclusion yet. But actually, this is the picture we, we get. Um, so there's actually a hierarchy of containments here. Regular languages are a subset of the context-free languages, which are in turn a subset of the decidable languages, which are in turn are a subset of the recognized, the Turing recognizable languages. Um, and so uh, with that, I think we're gonna just move to our little bit of a review of what we've done today. So we proved that pumping lemma as a tool for showing that languages are not context-free languages. Um, we define Turing machines, which is gonna be our model um, uh, that we're gonna be focusing on for the rest of the term. Uh, not forgetting the other models because they're going to be useful examples for us. Um, and we define Turing deciders, Turing machine deciders that halt in all inputs. Okay, so I think with that, um, we have come to the end of today's lecture. Um, I will stick around a little bit and answer questions in the chat. Um, I will try to share them with everybody um, as I'm answering them, so I'm not just talking to one person. How is the concept applied in, so I'm getting one question about the practicality of all this. Uh, bunches of questions are coming in. Um, uh, so look, uh, is, this, is this stuff all practical? Um, uh, I would say um, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, I don't know which concept you have in mind. We're, we're going to introduce lots of concepts in this course. And um, uh, the, you know, the concept of, um, uh, of you know, the finite automata and the pushdown automata and, and context-free languages definitely used in other uh, subjects and in, in other fields in computer science and elsewhere. These are very basic and fundamental notions. Um, and so, yes, and Turing machines, well, I mean, that's a model of a general computer. If you want to understand computation, you're going to need to understand some model, and a Turing machine is a particularly simple model, and that's why we use it. Uh, as it turns out, it doesn't really matter what model you use, but we'll talk about that next, uh, uh, next time. But yeah, I would say there's a lot of applied material in this course, uh, as time has shown, um, whether it's led to things like uh, public key cryptography, which is used on the internet, um, or, you know, understanding various algorithms. I mean, that's not the reason I study it. I study it because I'm a more of a, coming at it from more of a mathematical perspective. I just find the material very uh, beautiful and interesting and challenging, um, but it does have ap applications. Um, any other questions here? I think I'm gonna sign off then to get myself set up for my office hours, which is in a different, uh, on a different Zoom link. Okay, so thank you, everybody, and see you uh, on Thursday. Bye-bye.